so you can be aware of the chi in the body also the chi in the mind and you can be aware of the heat element the heat element yeah. Later this afternoon, we'll be doing a reflection on the body and the elements, huh? the six elements. And of course, after a few minutes, when the body cools down, you can f you can be aware of the heat element. You know when it goes down. So the heat element goes up and down, depending on our physical activity.
a very wise teacher, a very wise teacher once said, the world is in a very feverish state. The world is in a very feverish state, restless, agitated, and reactive. The mind changes from liking to disliking, from craving to aversion, from frustration to anxiety, with the agitation of the world. The mind changes from liking to disliking, from craving to aversion, from frustration to anxiety, with the agitation, restlessness of the world. If we can learn to make the mind still and calm, it will be the greatest blessing to the world. If we can learn to make the mind still and calm, it will be the greatest blessing to the world. Later, I'll give you the link for the Qigong video. There are two videos on YouTube. And you can do some of these even when you're uh, working in the work environment. Say if you're feeling stressed or frustrated or upset, you can just do one or two. You know, the balancing one, just breathe in. Breathe out. You can do this uh, sitting down. And you find that w when you do this, it's a very easy way to focus your mind, mm -hmm. especially when you're in a very busy, stressful environment. And say if somebody is being unpleasant to you, instead of reacting, just do this and smile. Hmm? And you ignore that person. <laughs> because in the end it's your reaction, right, to that person hmm? or to those unpleasant words, including criticism that determines your mental state. Because normally it's our reaction which throws us off balance and causes us some form of suffering and upset. A try and see next time. And also that person will be very puzzled, very confused. Right? Like, you know, what the hell is he doing? <laughs> 
This is why the Buddha gave a very radical teaching when he said, when you see, just see, when you hear, just hear. Don't react. It's a very, uh, it sounds simple, but it's a very uh, difficult practice, very challenging. Because we're so conditioned to react, right, from childhood. It's a, it's a habitual behavior of reacting. If things are pleasant, we feel good. If things are unpleasant, you know, we feel uh, upset, even angry. Mm. Or sometimes you feel, uh, you start feeling anxious about something. Mm. When you see, just see. When you hear, just hear. I'll just read this, uh, the benefits of mindfulness. Mm. Later I have a handouts hmm, after lunch. Mindfulness is a skillful way of relating to and connecting to life and daily experience. It is paying attention on purpose in the present moment and in a non-judgmental way. It is a way of being and it takes practice. It is calm attention to what is happening from moment to moment without discrimination or criticism. It is the observing power of the mind that sees without the filter of desire or aversion, liking or disliking, or delusional reaction. It is therefore a wholesome way of seeing what is happening in the present moment. Mindful breathing helps the mind, brings the mind home to the body. You begin to experience calmness, a sense of well-being and quiet joy. Breathing in, I know I am breathing in. Breathing out, I know I am breathing out. This helps her concentration and focus. And we begin to appreciate the fact of being alive instead of being distracted and confused by compulsive thinking. This knowing is, of course, uh, intuitive knowing, hmm? which is different from uh, intellectual knowing. Hmm? Intellectual knowing is based on thinking and memory, hmm? information. But intuitive knowing is something very different. Hmm? Just like when you breathe in mindfully, you know you're breathing in. When you breathe out, you know you're breathing out. Just like when you're hungry or tired, you know you're hungry or tired. Just like when you have to go to the washroom, you know you have to go. It's a natural intelligence. Just like when you're driving, you know when you have to stop. When you have to turn right, uh, when you have to turn left. And if you're changing lanes, you know when it's safe to uh, change lanes. And if you're walking, if you have to cross the road, you look right, you look left, you look right, and you know when it is safe to cross. It's natural intelligence. Mindful walking helps us to be in the present moment, and we can appreciate the beauty of the environment. We can stop and smell the roses and experience the joy of just being alive. And as you know, you can be in a, in a very beautiful environment, but if your mind is very preoccupied, hmm, we, are, we cannot really appreciate that beauty because we're not present, we're not receptive to it. Hmm. And of course, if you're emotionally upset about something, it doesn't matter where you are, because you're caught in that emotional state. Mindful eating in silence is a peaceful activity, and we can appreciate the food much more. When we're eating and talking, what we're talking about becomes more important than the food. The food becomes a secondary thing. I remember in Singapore watching people have lunch and only a very few people were actually eating mindfully. 
you can imagine most people were on their smartphones, hmm? either eating and scrolling, or a few people would stop eating and, you know, they would pick up their phone, you know, check, 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 put it down, eat a little, stop, pick up their phone, check, check, check. And I thought, my goodness, where are human beings evolving into? But you, you, you can, you, you find that if you're always checking your, your handphone, it, it agitates the mind. It agitates the mind. You can see it. So if you're, you know, if you're busy, just eating mindfully, hmm? eating lunch can be very peaceful. And if you're with friends, tell them that you want to eat peacefully and mindfully. Because, <laughs> you know, it's so easy to chit-chat with friends, right, when well, you're eating. But then what you're talking about becomes more important than the food. But when you eat mindfully, what you're eating is the most important thing. Being aware of tasting, chewing, swallowing very peaceful and you find too that you can appreciate the food much more hmm? when we appre when we eat mindfully mindful cleaning cooking and washing helps us to enjoy doing these activities instead of being in a hurry to finish them so that we can do other things present moment wonderful moment with mindfulness and calm focus, we can deal with our own suffering, or anxiety, fear, and worry, frustration, irritation, anger, resentment, sadness, and sorrow. You can embrace your mental, emotional upset and take care of it with compassion, kind acceptance, and patience. Mindful breathing can help us to stop thinking about the past with regret and guilt and stop thinking about the future with anxiety, fear and uncertainty. We're able to experience tranquility and stillness, which is most beneficial and precious in our busy and stressful lives. Mindfulness has the power to heal past traumas and conflicts because it is a state of non-duality and so one is able to be objective and see things as they are without identifying with them and let them go. Hmm? We'll be speaking more about non-duality. Mindfulness also helps us not to react to unpleasant words and situations and not to take things so personally. A great deal of our mental energy is caught up in habitual reactions. It is our reactions which make us burn out, which throws us off balance and cause us suffering and discontent, dis-ease. Things get better in our lives when we react less and less. We can remain calm and patient, wise, strong and secure. Then we can respond in a beneficial way and be helpful to others. Our basic problem in life is that we take things too personally, even things that are not directly related to us. This is an aspect of ignorance and delusion. Mindfulness is much more than you think. As we said, when we tend to react, we get thrown off balance. Mm, and we get, our minds are disturbed in some way. Mm. But if we can remain calm and mindful, then if, if you see somebody in need of help, or of course a young child is in danger, you can respond mm, in a beneficial way. Mm. And with mindfulness, we can appreciate the difference between reacting and responding. Our lives are not determined by what happens to us, but by how we react to what happens. Not by what life brings to us, but by our attitude we bring to life. The world is as it is. 
Life is constantly changing and uncertain. A calm and positive attitude brings a chain reaction of positive thoughts, events, and outcomes. It is a catalyst, a spark that creates extraordinary and surprising results. Events do not cause us suffering. They may cause us physical discomfort or some inconvenience and delay. It is our mental emotional reaction to those events that cause us suffering. Upset, anger, re frustration, anxiety, and despair. Without mindfulness, we're enslaved and deluded by mental activity, by too much thinking. This is the source of dukkha, mental emotional disturbance. We believe that to follow our impulses and satisfy our desires and expectations is freedom. This is an illusion. In fact, we're slaves to craving, clinging, frustration, fear, and despair. In mindfulness, one is not only restful, calm, and happy, but alert and awake. Meditation is not an evasion or escape. It is a clear and serene encounter with reality. Our minds are conditioned to react. Our brains are educated, programmed to label, judge, criticize, condemn, compare, to like or to dislike, to want or not to want, to have aversion and ill will. This is the conditioning of our mental defilements. So this is the cause of our conflicts, discontentment, disharmony, and dis-ease. The idea of a permanent, unchanging ego center or self is strengthened by this conditioning. And it is this deep-rooted illusion of a permanent, concrete, and separate ego center which is the source and cause of our problems and conflicts, fears and worries, craving, greed, and attachments. With mindfulness, we can skillfully deal with our thoughts and emotions. With objective awareness of our mental landscape, we can see thoughts as just thoughts, feelings as just feelings, moods and emotions and just moods and emotions. We can see and understand their impermanent, changing and uncertain nature and can therefore let them go, thus freeing the mind of suffering and dis-ease. Now, mindfulness is what gives us the ability to deal skillfully hmm, with not only too much mental activity mm, when thinking becomes very irrational, very obsessive, mm, when it becomes very critical and negative, uh, but it can help us to deal with uh, emotions, feelings, emotions and moods. Now, mindfulness, present moment awareness, is a state of non-duality, meaning there is no I being aware. Hmm? There's no self being aware. There's only that energy of awareness, that attention. Hmm? And when we practice, we can see that. Initially, we don't see that. Why? Because of our conditioned habit of identifying with our sense experiences. You know, we say, I'm seeing something, right? I am hearing something. Hmm? I'm eating and tasting something. Hmm? I'm smelling something. Hmm? I'm feeling something by touch, and I'm thinking something. Hmm? So by identifying with these experiences, we create duality in the mind, meaning subject and object. Mm -hmm. The I is the subject, of course. And this was one of the insights of the Buddha. He realized that the senses were actually sensing by themselves. Mm -hmm. They happen automatically. Mm -hmm. 
for example, say if your eyes are healthy, all you have to do is just look and seeing arises, doesn't it? And if you're not sure about this, just close your eyes for a second and then open them. You see, seeing consciousness arises at the speed of light. It's really a miracle when you think of it. And to be more precise, light enters the, the eyes, it creates an image at the, at the back of the retina, the optic nerves pick, picks up the image, and instantly there is seeing consciousness. It happens automatically. But because we say, I am seeing something, hmm, it gives you the illusion that there's a seer hmm, that is seeing something or a seer that is separate from the visible object. Hmm? I wonder if you see that. Just like hearing. Hmm? If your ears are, are healthy, hearing arises naturally, doesn't it? But because we say, I am hearing something, hmm? and of course, I like it or don't like it, or it's too noisy, etc., we create that illusion that there's a listener, a hearer, that is separate from the sound. Very interesting. Just like when we start eating, like say lunch, you can experiment with this. Tasting arises automatically, doesn't it? And if you're not sure about this, when you're having lunch, just say to yourself, okay, I'm going to eat this mindfully and I'm going to try not to taste the food. See what happens. <laughs> you can't avoid it, right? As long as you have taste buds on your tongue, tasting arises naturally. But again, because we identify with that experience, we say, you know, I'm tasting this food. I like it or I don't like it. Hmm? Or it needs some chili sauce. <laughs> or it needs a too, it's too salty and so on. Hmm? Or I wish I had chicken curry instead of this thing. <laughs> So you create the illusion eh, that there's an eater, a taster, separate from the food, mm, the flavor. Same with smelling. Smelling arises automatically. Mm, but then we react to it, you know, I like it, I don't like it, or it stink, and so on. Mm, we create that duality between a smeller, which is separate from the smell, from the odor. Mm, same with feeling, sensation. We feel something and we react to it. Hmm? Hmm? It's cool, it's hot, it's smooth, I like it or I don't like it, and so on. So we create that duality between a feeler separate from that sensation, that touch sensation. And the same with thinking. Hmm? We say, I'm thinking these thoughts or I'm thinking those thoughts. Or these are or unwholesome thoughts, I should be thinking wholesome thoughts, and so on. So again, you create a duality between a thinker separate from thoughts. But in fact, there's no thinker separate from thoughts. Mm, the thinker is actually a part of thinking. And when you're very mindful, you can see that. And this is why many, um, even during the Buddha's time, or the early forest yogis, they they try to stop thinking. You know, I'm going to sit and I'm going to try to stop thinking. And I think that's how migraine headaches began. <laughs> because what they didn't realize is the I, the thinker, you know, is a part of thinking. So trying to stop thinking is like thinking is trying to stop thinking. Because the I is really a thought. When you say I am thinking, it's just thinking when you're aware. Very interesting, the whole condition of duality. But of course, with practice, we begin to see this. And of course, as humans, we also identify with feelings and emotions, don't we? You know, a happy feeling arises, we say, I am happy, perfectly natural. Unhappy feeling arises, we say, I am unhappy. Hmm? Or I'm upset, I'm afraid, I'm frustrated, I'm feeling lonely, I am bored, and so on. 
So when we identify with a feeling or emotion, we hold on to it as something personal. And what the Dhamma is teaching us is that these feelings and emotions, they don't belong to us. Mm, they arise due to certain conditions and they pass away. Now when we initially identify with a happy feeling, you know, I am happy, no problem, no dukkha. Why? Because it's pleasant. Mm, it feels good. But when we say I am unhappy, I'm upset, I'm afraid, and so on, there is dukkha, hmm? because it's unpleasant. But what the Dhamma is teaching us is, is that whether, is some, whether something is pleasant or unpleasant, it is impermanent. Hmm? It's a temporary mental state, a changing condition of the mind. And this is why people who become too attached to a pleasant feeling hmm, eventually experience frustration. Hmm, because anything that feels good, feels pleasant, we want it to be permanent, don't we? Hmm? Or we want it to last as long as possible. But you know from experience, it changes. Of course you can enjoy it if, and enjoy feeling happy, but don't expect it to be permanent. It changes. So this is why in mindfulness we learn how to objectify these feelings and emotions. Instead of saying, for example, I'm upset or I'm angry or I'm frustrated, you just breathe mindfully and you say, there is a state of upset or there is upset. Mm, there's a state of anger, or there is anger. Mm, there's a state of frustration, mm, or there's a state of fear, or I, there's a state of fear. You see the difference, there's a big difference mm, in saying I'm upset and there is upset. I'm afraid and there is fear, or there's a state of fear. I want this or I must have this, and there's a state of desire, hmm? a state of craving. Big difference. And uh, mindfulness is what gives us that ability to see things as it is without identifying with them. And know it is impermanent. And you come back to present moment awareness and you allow that feeling, emotion, that mental state to pass away, to fade away. So there's no struggle. You're not trying to control it. You're not trying to suppress. You see it as it is and you allow it to fade away. And when emotions are very strong, as you know, it's not easy to sit with strong emotions. And this is where something like Qigong, qigong comes in. <laughs> you can release that strong emotion. Hmm. Actually in Canada there was this one guy who came to some of the classes and he told me he was always getting upset at work. You know, he was always very reactive. He was either get upset from just general stress or with his co-workers or of course with his boss. So I, I showed him some of these simple practices that he could do, that he could do while working and it really helped him a lot. And I said to him, if you're really frustrated, really angry, go to the washroom, go find an empty room or outside, or go in the, in the stairway, you know, the stairway. And he can do the ah, he can do the ah qigong, <laughs> and the balancing, and do the balancing, you know, just to release that, that anger, frustration, yeah. So it really helped him. And he said, he said even my wife can tell the difference. And she would know, right? <laughs> she would know. Yeah. Okay, so before we break for lunch, let us just do this uh, mindful chanting. It's very simple. And it's the mantra from the Heart Sutra. Some of you may know the Heart Sutra. Very profound teaching based on anatta, non-self, and emptiness. And it goes, Gatte, gatte, para, gatte, parasam, gatte, 
Shakti Bodhisvaha. And it means going beyond, going well beyond the world of dukkha, the world of ignorance and delusion, craving and attachment, aversion and ill will, going beyond the, the illusion of duality and separation. And Bodhisvaha means rejoice in the freedom, bliss, and peace of awakening. Gatte gatte para gatte parasam gatte bodhisvaha. 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 Gatte gatte para gatte dharam gatte bodhisvaha. Gatte gatte para gatte parasam gatte bodhisvaha. Gatte gatte para gatte parasam gatte bodhisvaha. Gatte gatte para gatte parasam gatte Bodhisvaha.
Okay, and now we'll um, have a lunch break. If you have any questions, you can write them down on the paper there, and we can uh, discuss your questions after. Okay, be well, be happy.